Welcome, everybody. My name is Steve Case, I'm Senior Admissions Counselor here at Western. I'm sure you're, hopefully you're not tired of seeing my face yet, but we appreciate everyone's attendance so far. We have a great session for you today. Um, we are joined by our College of Arts and Sciences. They're going to go over information about their college, all the ins and outs of what's, what it takes and what it can offer to transfer students. Um, as always, we will be uh, monitoring the chat. So if during the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Uh, we will do our best to answer them. And then we will also have a question answer session at the very end of the presentation, uh, open discussion with the College of Arts and Sciences, the folks we have here with our uh, transfer admissions team and so on and so forth. And I will kick it over to Gabriella, uh, take it away. Awesome, thanks for the intro. So hi everybody, Gabriela Salawanchek with Arts and Sciences, as you know. Um, I am a twice alum of Western, so I do believe brown and gold. Uh, both my parents were alum as well, so I guess it just runs in the family. I'll let my counterpart introduce herself. Thanks, Gabriela. Uh, my name is Diana Bluen. I'm the Assistant Director of Academic Advising here at Western Michigan University in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I too am a double alum of uh, WMU, also pleading brown and gold. I will uh, fight Gabriela for the title of who bleeds more brown mm -hmm. and gold. Um, here to help you um, and answer any questions that, uh, that you might have today. Arts and sciences, when we say arts and sciences, as I'm sure you know, we mean the sciences are STEM, social sciences and humanities. Um, sometimes students get confused with that, with the fine arts, but liberal arts. So we are one of the largest colleges on campus. Uh, there are seven, we're the largest with around 4,000 students enrolled, 25 different departments, 100 plus majors and minors. So a lot of the time students will be overwhelmed when I talk with them or when they see this and they're like, oh my gosh, like I wasn't sure what I wanted to study and now I really don't know. Um, but we actually have a pretty good advising team set in place to help guide them. So when they're here, but then also I know because they are transfers, they talk with you. So usually when I have those conversations with students, I'll say, well, did you talk to your you know, community college advisor? What did they talk with you about? And then they'll say, oh, I talked with them about this, this. And then I say, okay, well, now that you talked with them, I recommend you talked with a Western advisor and then you can bring that information back and talk to your advisor again. So just kind of having that open line of communication to fully understand like, how the uh, credits transfer over, um, what classes you should take, and just all that jazz. This is where most of our recent graduates have gone, Stryker and Pfizer, name a couple of big wigs. We do have the um, survey, I guess, the survey that's put together every December from the previous year that Career Services put together of where all of our graduates go. If you have not seen that before or you'd like a copy of it, let me know and I can direct you to where that is. It kind of just tells, you know, like where, like what classes, well, what professors, like how they received our professors, um, places that they've gone, both for undergrad and graduate work. So we have undergraduate research. I know that sometimes students will come um, and one of the deciding factors of where they're gonna go for a four year could be research. And we do offer it for undergraduate students. They can get in that, you know, Henneke Hall, which is swipe access only to work with professors like Dr. Wendy Bean, who does uh, cell research with her flatworms. And then she'll go out into the community with Project Lead the Way, places like Goebbels High School, where they have like this biomedical labs, like science lab set up and she'll come in and teach them what it's like to be in the sciences, bring her worms, go through experiments, and she'll bring undergraduate students with her to help in those classrooms. So not only are you able to then um, do the undergrad, like the research with her, you're able to get out in the community and discuss it as well. Um, we also have a dino park, shameless plug. We do have a TikTok if you ever want to, if you are on that side of it. Um, we have a video on there about it, but basically we have a dino park that's above our particle accelerator because you can't build anything on top of particle accelerators apparently but we have some dinos um and students like that area because it's just really cool to have that randomly on campus hammocks but then also sometimes classes will pull that in there because there's flora and fauna that um mimics the mesozoic era and then we have like fort saint joseph there is a six credit course you can take over the summer where you go out to niles where we have an affiliation with an archeological site out there. And students are able to excavate artifacts dating back to like the 1700 fur trading times. And then they bring those artifacts back here. I talked to somebody there a couple of weeks ago and they said they brought back 10,000 from this past summer around that. And they're now cataloging them. That takes all winter. So um, it, it's a really cool class for you to take 
because also you get to meet students from other universities, other areas, because it is such an artifact and rich site. Students, not only from Western, but from places like GVSU, Michigan State, other universities will come because it is, it's a big deal to be part of that. You know, that's my favorite thing to talk about oh, yeah. the undergraduate research. So you got to pause on my slide for just a second. You go. Um, I used to be I used to be the uh, biology advisor here uh, for about seven years before moving into the assistant director position. So my heart is uh, is kind of in this undergraduate research, and I've watched a lot of students. I don't know, really kind of self actualize with becoming involved in research as undergraduates. So they they don't really need to to have to want to to do research in their career in order to be involved. Mm -hmm. We're just um, we're in just such a sweet spot at this university where we're just we do qualitative research um, in these labs we are a research institution but we're also small enough to kind of invite undergraduates into our labs and you won't find that in some of the larger institutions so if you peruse any of the department websites and you click on research you go to the faculty home pages you'll see undergraduates in their labs and actively doing research uh, we're pretty proud of that, um, especially in the College of Arts and Sciences. So uh, it's simply just, you know, knocking on a door or emailing a professor and, and saying that, you know, I really like what you're doing in your in your lab and I would love to be a part of it. And if there's room, um, there's a culture of acceptance of those undergraduates into those research, whether it whether it's a scientific lab or just into research in a department like English or philosophy. Um, that being said, undergraduates are then on published works at Western, so you can peruse our Heineke Hall and see a lot of the posters and see um, that our undergraduates have been on published work, which is pretty impressive. What's also nice, is we also have other learning opportunities that are not just research based. I mm -hmm. know like within places like health, um, education, human development, everybody does like an internship part of their teaching um, curriculum. Although we don't have anything required like that, we do have opportunities for students to be able to do internships, to do practicums, get that, you know, quote unquote, hands-on experience that they want. Uh, they, we typically, I encourage them to talk to their advisor about how to set that up because sometimes it depends on the department. It could be an independent study. It could be a specific course you have to take. It all depends. Uh, these are just some of the registered student organizations within arts and sciences. Um, these are just kind of nice to know because I will be sending you this PDF to everyone afterward. And so this is kind of in the back of your mind if somebody says like they're interested in joining like our chemistry club. Our chemistry club is actually really active with the, on campus and in the community, just educating students, kids. Like they usually use slime, which is pretty cool, but uh, they work with very closely with the faculty. And so it's just a nice way to get involved. And I know that with COVID, it made it very hard for students even now to connect um, so I really try to discuss or push these and push sounds bad, but I, you know, I try to just encourage them to check them out. So we do have study abroad. That's a big component within arts and sciences. One in 10 of our students in a typical year will study abroad. We do have some students studying abroad now, another shameless plug for our social media. Um, can you tell I run it? So for our Instagram, we actually have some students that have been sending us photos from where their trips right now. So we had one that was in Spain, but there are students that do study abroad. One of my student ambassadors is applying to study abroad for the full year next year in Japan. And so um, I know sometimes, I know like right now, some students aren't even thinking about that, but we do have scholarships if they are interested. And because we have a two semester language requirement, it can also help knock that out. And, kind of, and you know, you can, I usually tell them you can choose to stay here for another Michigan winter, or you can go to Costa Rica. We are supportive of study abroad in arts and sciences, um, especially in advising. I think we will sit down with students um, and help make those plans if they come to us um, and say they're interested in study abroad, the sooner the better, even if they're not going to do it until, you know, later in their program. And as transfer students, obviously that time here is more condensed. So as soon as they meet with us and they just breathe that they're interested in study abroad, we're sending them over to the SA office and then they're in turn kind of coming back and we're making this graduation plan that incorporates um, that, that time away uh, and perhaps taking courses that will um, expedite um, you know, their, their program as well at the same time. So definitely it's a team effort um, and we're accustomed to doing that for them. 
And also just a story, um, because I always like to throw out stories because then you have something to add. Um, I had a student ambassador that studied political science. She studied abroad in Sweden. And while she was over there, she met with some of the professors that were there. Um, so we feel that were in the community and she was able to create her thesis, her research thesis, which then got published. And then she was able to still work with them. So she started working with people, not only for, in Sweden, but then also she, um, there were some people at U of Michigan State that she met up with and they furthered her presentation. It had had like 80 downloads or something like that. So when I say presentation, her published work. So, uh, you know, you never know when you study abroad, like who you'll meet, what you'll be able to do. Scholarships. So we do not have an arts and sciences scholarship. We do have transfer ones through admissions, as I'm sure you are aware of. Most of them for us are departmental, but we do focus more on retention. So what I mean by that is we typically don't have too many for first year students, but we do for transfers and people that are in the upper levels or students in upper levels. So definitely encourage them to check out our scholarships that we have if they want to come for fall. February 15th is coming up here. That is when like the deadline is. And then for October 15th, the deadline for um, spring. So, and then we have pathways. Um, not, I know that you met with CEHD and they um, education, they probably talked about the secondary education pathway. So I'll go over what that means for arts and sciences, but we have three different pathways for our students to choose from. You'll never meet a pre-med major here at Western or pre-law. There'll be something like biomedical sciences with a pre-health focus or a pre-health pathway. And Diana, I'm gonna let you talk about this one because you were the advisor for it. So you go, go. Yes. Um, so I still wear my pre-health advising hat. Um, why throw away the experience I had when I was over in, in the biological sciences department, right? But we also have a, a wonderful pre-health advisor, um, Megan Larson. Uh, so between the two of us, we can guide your student um, to any of those um, uh, endeavors listed under the pre-health pathway um, and others as well. Uh, those are, we're not, we're not, you know, bound by anything there. We just have experience as to what kinds of things you need to be doing co-curricularly, if that's a word, if I can say co-curricularly, um, as well as additional coursework that you might need to make yourself a viable candidate for um, any of these. We can help with major choices. So if you have your, if your transfer student is coming in and it's still a little bit undecided, they usually see me, I ask them what they wanna do. Uh, they know that it's health in some way and we kind of go through the list and I provide them with options. Um, but I also provide them with options from other colleges too if it appears that might be a better fit. Um, you know, if they're nursing, certainly they're not going to be in the College of Arts and Sciences. It's very vocational, um, but they do have an advisor to guide them along the way. In addition to their academic advisor, um, Megan Larson is enrolled in one where she is advising for uh, the biological sciences department. So if they are biomed or biology, they're already getting that pre-health advising. But if they're a theater major and they want to apply to med school, they're still getting that guidance from myself to make sure that they're getting all of the things done that they need to get along the way. So um, it's it's a bit of a kind of a holding of hands uh, between this entity and across the abyss to the next, right? I usually just throw a couple RSOs that they can join on here. One of the WMU pre-med chapter, the reason why I threw that one on there is because I actually used to work at WMED um, and I helped set up the tour for when this group came in. So they got to meet the assistant dean of admissions they got to see a TBL hall or a lecture hall, the simulation center. And so it's nice to be able to go check out WMED because we have, since we have an affiliation with them, there's two different perks to that. You are able to apply to the WMED start your junior year of college. With WMED Start, what's nice about that is that you can apply for it your junior year and you don't have your MCAT score yet. And so you don't have to submit that. You submit your ACT or SAT scores and then you submit your transcripts, application fee, all that jazz. And then if you get invited for an interview and you get accepted, you sign a contract saying, yes, I want to go to the WMED. This is the only place for me. And then your senior year, you take the MCAT as a formality. And so it doesn't matter if you get the 30th, the... Um, 60th, 90th percentile, you are already in medical school, like you're going. Uh, if you don't get into the WMED Startway, that's okay. 
you can apply through the traditional route. And so then what you do is um, you just take the MCAT, usually like you, you know, spring, junior year, they just apply in the summer and it, it doesn't hinder their chances they didn't get in that first time around. And they get to move through the process quicker. I always use Vanderbilt. I don't know why. Don't know why. But if you're applying from Vanderbilt and then a Western student, that Western student may find out in a week if they're going to get their telephone interview, whereas somebody from Vanderbilt may wait like a month because they get like 4,000 applications for 84 spots. Okay, uh, the pre-law pathway. Uh, something I forgot to mention, uh, The we have a pre-law and a pre-health seminar course that we can register students for. I'm not sure, Diana, is it tip, do transfer students, are they able to take that course? Yes. So okay. traditionally we, we plop um, all our beginner students in it that first semester, uh, but oftentimes when meeting with a transfer student, we discuss this uh, pre, pre-health uh, profession seminar and uh, I'll enroll them or help them enroll in, in that course as a first semester transfer student as well. Megan Larson, who is the Priya Health Advisor for the Biological Sciences, does teach the course. She invites um, folks from the community in different professions in, in health, um, physicians assistants, um, you know, uh, phys- like medical physicians, I- I'm not using the right terminology right now, um, Uh, optometrists, dentists, um, chiropractors, and they come in and they do the kind of panel and then they do a research paper at the end and they look at maybe five or six schools that they would potentially apply to um, and look into what the requisites are and the prerequisites for applying to those institutions. Um, So there's, those are the types of real um, practical things that they need to do in the seminar course. There is a class that I usually recommend for students to check out the wrongful conviction program. It's or the instance project. Um, basically, it's the most common causes of wrongful conviction. Um, they review the case files, all that kind of stuff. We also have a criminology lab. And right now they're doing cold cases and they're trying to solve different cold cases that are cold. So I don't know how to add that. <laughs> I just keep saying cold, but they're able to work with the faculty that are um overseeing those cases and just kind of get a behind the scenes or get a view of like what it's like. And then the pre-law society, I typically recommend for students to join. And then last but not least, our newest edition as of fall 2020, that is, that's further away now than in my, than I thought it was in my mind. But anyways, so you are able to pick one of these content areas. So like biology, Latin, something like that. And then you pick your minor and you can take these three courses on the side over here through the College of Education and Human Development. And these contact hour courses allow you then to sit for the MTTC, which you need in order to apply for the master's program. So when you graduate with your degree from Western, it'll say a master of science in biology. It won't say secondary education. And so this could, this is good for students then that decide to pivot or change their mind. So if a, well, it's good either way, but like if a student decides like I'm studying biology, I really like it. Then halfway through, they're like, I don't think I want to teach it. I think I want to actually be in the lab. That's completely fine. They're not set back at all. They don't have to go back in any semesters because they're not switching their major completely. They're just changing their focus with their electives and looking at, you know, what other classes should I take? So um, it's nice in that way, because then, like I said, but if they decide later they don't want to teach or something like that, it won't be on their resume. Like for example, I studied early childhood education. That will forever be my degree, even though I'm not in early childhood anymore. So it's just kind of nice. Um, integrated science and social studies. I get asked about that a lot. Um, integrated science, because I had somebody that was interested in teaching physics. They would study something like integrated science with a minor in physics. And then they'd have the pre-secondary education pathway. So then this will allow them then to be more marketable because they'll be able to teach across, you know, a bunch of areas within science, but then they'll have a little bit more focus within the physics area. So if they do want to teach like an honors physics course or something like that, they'll be able to be like, yeah, well, I had a minor and I take these extra courses and they'll be able to, you know, discuss that. Same thing with social studies, a slew of, you know, all those areas, but then you can have like a minor in like political science or like history or something like that. And then this is the, the linked RSO that you can join. These are the advisors that we had talked about. I wanted to add some faces to names. <laughs> um, like I said, I will send this to you afterward, but 
Megan Larson for pre-health, Tom for pre-law, and Beth for secondary education. Okay, online programs. I do get asked about, you know, I'm interested in X, Y, and Z. Like, what do I, how can I take online courses for that? We do not have on, we have online courses in pretty much everything, right? Like we have a class that you can take in this subject area because one, online courses are nothing new, but then two, with COVID and everything else, we just have more options. But what's nice about these online programs is that now we have it for like psychology or for strategic communication. So if you're majoring in psychology and you want to, you don't want to take online courses, you want to be here on campus, it can be nice if you decide to go home for the summer or there's a class that's closed in person because it's an online course option as well, or like the programs offered online, nine times out of 10, they'll also offer that class online. So say that the in-person class for like some like operative behavioral course that you really want to take is closed in person, if you, there might be an online option. So it just kind of gives you more flexibility, a more like broad pick and choose how you want to take your courses. So you can do it exclusively online. If they do decide to transfer over or like to apply for that, they do need to mark that on their application though. They do need to mark that they are interested in the online program. And then we have certificates and minors as well. Accelerated graduate degree programs. I'm going to point this one out down here. Public administration was just added like two days ago. So that's a brand new one. But basically accelerated graduate degree programs, um, your senior year, if you get into the master's program, you can take up to 12 credits that go towards your master's, but you pay undergraduate tuition rate. And these are all the ones that you can get. Usually, I know that first time students aren't too interested in this. Transfer students are a little bit more interested when I talk with them about it. I mean, Diana, do you have anything to add about that? That's pretty much it for that. Just if they're interested to see us, see their advisor, ASAP, because there's some planning involved. They have to apply for graduation early and get an audit and then be able to plan to have those uh, courses that will apply to that graduate program in, in their plan so that they can make the, you know, have the best bang for their buck. If that makes any sense. So I believe it's up to is it 12 credits and maybe yep. you already said that. Um, so it's up to 12 credits from the future grad program um, that can potentially be applied, but they can do as, as little as three or six um, and still make a little headway if they don't have time to get all 12 in, if that makes any sense. And that's arts and sciences in a nutshell. So those are the areas that can follow, but really, I really want, I mean, the social media can follow, but really want to point out is this um, advising email at the bottom. So when I send you the PDF, I'm also going to CC Diana. So if you have any, like, if you want to talk to Diana about advising or anything like that, like she is open, Diana, I'm just throwing you out there, but she is open to answer those questions for you. Um, if you just have more like general things, you can just always send it to this advising email too. And then this is the advising office phone number for us. Yeah, at okay. this time, I think if um, um, our arts and sciences folks are done uh, with their presentation, feel free to throw any questions in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself, you can always uh, ask a question out loud. Either way, everyone here is happy to help. If you folk, if you would all just kind of maybe uh, either of you talk about when it comes to transfer students, maybe like a tip or something that you run into frequently with made with um, your majors. Uh, in dealing with transfer students that might be helpful for the group to pass along? Just any any kind of helpful information. As you, Diana, throwing it to you. Yeah, I can, I can take that, but there are so many avenues I can go with that kind of open-ended. I mean, it's a pretty broad question. So, um, I, I don't mean, know, maybe... Well, I have two. I have one about myself that's anecdotal, okay. and, then, and then I can make it uh, academic as well. So, as a former transfer student from KVCC myself, um, back in 95-ish, um, I never really felt like I was a Bronco or part of this university. And um, if I could go back in time, I would certainly be more involved in campus activities. It wasn't until I was um, you know, just graduating and then moving on to my master's degree that I really started to, to kind of feel like a part of this community. Since then, obviously, leaps and bounds, um, there are so many opportunities via um, Office of Student Transitions and Orientation that we provide. 
Um, but I would just encourage your transfer students to get involved in every single thing that we are providing them to make that transition um, so that they feel like they're part of this community because it's really easy as a transfer student to say, I've got all this and not do the things. Um, that's the thing that I highlight when, I've, when I'm seeing my students for sure. Um, academically, um, you know, guidance and tips for transfer students uh, would be to kind of follow the steps through Office of Student Transitions right now, because they're they're really making sure that the students are getting everything they need as long as they're following this this route, right? Which also includes um, advising, and that's a little different than it has been in past years. I guess that's I guess that's it. Oh, and if they want to talk to us ahead of time while well, they're still involved with you and they haven't made the leap yet, seeing prospective students is a really good way to make sure that we're getting, they're getting everything they need on both ends. And I've never talked to an advisor at this institution that hasn't been happy to do that. Um, it's very easy to make a prospective student appointment, but I'll find that sometimes students don't come talk to us till after they've already um, been admitted and it certainly doesn't need to happen that way. And we're not adversaries you and I, we're on the same team. So I'd like to promote more phone calls between us, more emails between us. Um, if you have questions, call me and say, I've got this student that's looking to transfer and be in you know, philosophy or biomed, but we're struggling with A, B, and C. Um, please, please call um, and we can work together as a team. Perfect, thank you. Any, anyone, uh, anyone have some questions then? It looks like Christine, you're unmuted. Um, yeah, I just to confirm, none of the programs in art and sciences have like a secondary admissions process or selective admissions, right? Everyone just chooses their major on the transfer app and then that's what they are. Yes. Come on over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. I assumed I assumed so. Yeah. Un that's unlike, you know, fine arts cool. and, and having to yeah. audition uh, yeah. or be accepted to a program like, uh, you know, you're pre nursing and yeah. then you have to be yeah. accepted into the College of Nursing. You are right. I cannot think of a program in my college that doesn't accept you like in utero. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Even. Money. Even in some of the hard sciences where it's a little bit tough for students, they get, sometimes they're spinning their wheels a little bit, but okay. you know, uh, sometimes they pick up traction at the end and they get through it. So um, nobody, then, nobody's putting yeah. their kids out. Yeah. We do have pre-majors, Christine, and yeah, yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to apply in a way, but it might mean, it might be a stop gap to ensure that they have a particular GPA uh, or they passed right. particular courses or have certain courses done before they, they are actually declared the full, uh, the full major. But other departments have diminished that or gotten rid of it. Like psychology is no longer providing a pre psychology major you're just you go right into psychology now um starting in what was that gabriella fall 20 i think it seems like everything changed in fall 20 I, I think I was it was saying, fall 21 it was fall it was just past fall yeah when they changed when they merged the majors together but some of your transfer students are coming in and in, in you know they're in the older catalog year but my advisor in psychology is going listen this is actually a better fit so we're gonna like pop you in this one and your gen eds were in the old catalog, but we're going to jam your gen eds into this new gen ed, you know, Wes. So we're doing what's best for students. Yeah, definitely. And then the for the accelerated programs, that's not like a formal program that they have to apply for. It's more of a conversation planning thing directly with the advisor for some of the stronger students. I think you I think you ex you articulated it very well. I, I don't, hmm. they still need to be accepted into that graduate program, but I- So they are applying not, to it's graduate not the, program. The yeah, they are applying to a graduate okay. program. There is an application that goes to the grad college as part of the process because that's a separate college, right? So you, but I, I, I don't wanna say it's just a formality because certainly if the student is, is, is a poor student, they could say no. Um, I have yet to run across that because the students that are interested in it are generally, you know, ready to, ready to take on that graduate level work, but certainly they have the ability to say no and not accept the student into the, in, into the grad program, but um, it's been rare. And so, so I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we have 
transfer students that are interested in that, you know, they're a traditional student coming in after two years, would they be eligible to do that right away? Or is that something that's typically reserved for the senior year after they have a semester or two at Western under their belt? Yeah, I would say it's per student um, and it's a conversation, as you stated, uh, with the academic advisor and then a separate conversation with the graduate advisor. Uh, the plan is created and I don't think that not having a, I, I would think that they would at least need a semester at Western for those in both their department as an undergraduate and the graduate college to be able to see that they have got some chops. Yeah, yeah. But the plan would need to be created quite soon so that they could take advantage of getting the upper level coursework in there. So the conversation should be had right away. And certainly there might be departments that are like, you know, this is great with us. We don't need to see, you know, all of those courses at Western, but you might get a, a heavy science department that says, yeah, let's let's see what happens after you take physical chemistry and then we'll talk, you know. Anybody else have any other questions? Uh, drop in the chat or um, anybody uh, uh, on uh, the admissions side have anything for the good of the group? I know we do uh, just uh, uh, FYI, we do have, um, we are actively looking for obviously uh, partnerships, articulations, things like that. And um, Colin, uh, uh, Colin Scott on our uh, call today manages those. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to run them through any of us, but uh, they typically go through Colin eventually. So I'm um, sure he's happy to take uh, any questions about that um, now or in the future, if you haven't communicated with him already. Yeah, no, if there's a, if anyone has any questions or you see um, changes in your student population that are uh, maybe gravitating towards certain majors that um, a partnership would better yield, um, just a good pathway for those students, let us know. Um, we're seeing a lot of student movement on our end as well. So uh, right now um, we're open to just assisting your students as best we can. I'll just extend one more time uh, my availability for questions uh, via email or phone call anytime. Same Diane, I have our, a question on that. Yeah, ahead, if if we ahead. have a student who, um, we get students all the time who come to us with questions regarding the process for admissions, but then of course, then it turns to more major specific. It gets out of our, our realm. Um, we always send them to your department. We always send them, tell them to contact you. Is, is that, would you, would you agree with that process? Is that the best thing we can do? Sure, I think that's, Callan, I think that's the best way to do it because if, if, if they contact the College of Arts and Sciences Advising Office, most of the time you're talking to Kayla or one of my uh, expert students, one of our ambassadors up front, and really it helps us to triage who's the best person for them to be speaking with. We have our experts within our own house um, that can guide them if it's really major specific, but if it's like, hey, I want to go to medical school, but I don't know what major, they know to send them to me. So it's just, it's a, it's, it's kind of a, a, a tree that extends from there. So sending them here to this office, um, the College of Arts and Sciences office, which was on the slide deck, last slide, right, Gabriella, was our general information. Um, that is the best way. But if you have specific questions and want to go right to me, that's perfectly fine. Does that help, Colin? It does. No, we, we get we get some random questions. We have students who are looking at minors um, and then they were like, well, should I stay within the college? Like I'm a business major, but then now I'm thinking this or I have this passion to start this business, um, especially when I start to when I talk to entrepreneurial minded students, um, business is always one aspect of it. But then I find that arts and sciences is the other aspect. So and if it's if it's outside of the college, certainly, you, you know, they're going to get the better information from the other college uh, about that particular minor um, or second mm -hmm. major, perhaps. Right. right. So certainly sending them that direction is going to give them uh, the the more detailed information. If they talk to us first, we're, we're going to have a conversation, but then mm -hmm. we're going to end up guiding them there for the details anyway. Transfer students are always, in a sense, they're, they're always unique. So in many cases, they could do the double major. So um, we usually refer them to your, your, your teams and let you guys coordinate from there. So we'll continue. Yeah, well, I mean, we do have plenty of time, uh, but um, if we don't have anything else. Obviously, we want to be respectful of everyone else's time. So um, I guess final anything from for the good of the group. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate all the support. Absolutely. Absolutely. Have a great day. And for Pete's sake, stay warm.
Yes. yes. Seriously, though. <laughs> um, to wish you the best of uh, uh, the rest of the week and the rest of the semester. I'm sure we'll be in touch with all of you frequently. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you and working with you and your students moving forward to become Broncos. So thank you so much and have a great uh, afternoon.